but uh, I love to be here in this church and thankful for what God is doing. And, and if you're watching online, uh, we're thankful that you're here. You know, I've, I, I attend uh, Church on the Ridge in Snoqualmie, Washington, and during the pandemic, uh, I was often a host for our online service and uh, still do that once in a while if I'm on the road or home and I'm able to accommodate that for the nine o'clock service. So uh, I appreciate you people that are, are watching faithfully uh, online and uh, maybe something I'll say today is for you as well. So this morning, I wanna talk about the Jesus-hearted father my wife wrote a book, it's available out there, called The Jesus-Hearted Woman. She wrote that 10 years ago, and uh, it's been a bestseller. But I've always thought that really that's a good description for our Heavenly Father, that he has a heart of Jesus. And I'm going to unpack that and talk more about that. But all of us uh, have different feelings and emotions, uh, and since Father's Day was just last Sunday, uh, about our relationship with our earthly father. And for some people, it's very contentious. There's tension. Sometimes it's kind of a passive, aggress aggressive, love-hate relationship that you might have had with your earthly father. And that might somehow taint or certainly uh, color the picture that you have of your heavenly father as well. And uh, I, I, want to, I want to talk about that. And, you know, our own experiences help kind of color our perceptions and the way that we view a lot of things in life. I remember one time when I was preaching at uh, Bethel Church in Chehalis, where I pastored for 13 years, uh, every Sunday, we, we had a, a bit of a revival, and we had a, a wonderful group of young people that were very faithful to church on Sunday morning, not just youth service, and they would sit down in kind of the middle sections, and we had several hundred people there that Sunday and uh, that I'm going to refer to, and every Sunday, and uh, God was helping the church to grow. Eventually, we went to three services on Sunday morning. But that Sunday morning, when I was talking to the young people, I wanted to get across to them how important it is to use your time wisely. And so I'd chosen a verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that says, there is a time for everything and a, per a season for everything and a time for every purpose under heaven. And... and, and uh, I encourage the students to look it up on their, in their Bible, because we didn't have Bible apps in those days. They had actual Bibles. So I, I encourage everybody to look it up. The only problem is, unbeknownst to me, rather than saying what I thought I said, Ecclesiastes 3.11, I said Ecclesiastes 4.11. And so as, as I'm saying to them, and I'm trying to get the point across, I'm like, and some of them started to laugh and chuckle. And I was like, no, seriously, you ought to memorize this verse. This is really a great verse. And then somebody told me, Pastor, you said Ecclesiastes 4.11. So I looked it up. Here I am. And it says, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Well, the joke was on me. I wasn't encouraging our young people to sleep together, but it sounded like their pastor was doing that. So every time, every time since then that I read either Ecclesiastes 3.11 or 4.11, I think of that Sunday morning when I made a big blooper. And, uh, but let me ask you a question. Uh, when you think about God, I mean, when I think about that Sunday morning, I think about all those teenagers, many of whom now have teenagers of their own. But when, when I think about God, what picture comes to mind? So what picture comes to mind when you think about Jesus? What picture comes to mind when you think about the Holy Spirit? 
And what picture comes to mind when you think about God the Father? How do you picture him? Because the old-time view of God our Father sometimes portrayed him as a distant judge who wasn't really leaning into us with compassion and love, but was rather just kind of sitting in heaven with his arms folded and waiting to pronounce judgment on anyone that broke any one of the rules. And there weren't just 10 of them. There were a whole bunch of them. And, uh, but Jesus came to show us how much the Father loves us and cares about us. In Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said that our Heavenly Father delights to give good gifts to his children. When you think about our Heavenly Father, do you think about a good father that delights to give gifts to his children? Jesus said in Matthew uh, eleven twenty seven, all things have been committed to me by my Father, and no one knows the, fa- the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So Jesus himself talked about this interrelatedness between the Father and the Son, and certainly the Holy Spirit as well. John, the apostle, you know, he was probably the youngest one of the apostles. He was a fisherman, and uh, he was the one that wrote the Gospel of John. And he mentions himself there, but every time he does in the Gospel of John, all 21 chapters, he says the disciple that Jesus loved. He did this or that. Well, he was talking about himself. It was kind of his maybe pseudo-humble way of, of, you know, inserting his, his own story into the story. But I love what John said because he knew Jesus intimately. His epistles are all about the love of God and how much God loves us. And in John 1.18, in the message translation, he wrote it this way. Jesus came to show us the Father's heart. If we want to know what a Jesus-hearted Father looks like, we look at Jesus to see our Heavenly Father because John wrote, no one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. Jesus, this one-of-a-kind God expression, who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made him plain as day. Think about that. Jesus showed us the Father. And John, the apostle, the fisherman, wrote that if we want to see the Father, if we want to know what the Father looks like, we'll just look at Jesus. Because Jesus makes him plain as day. And you know, I love the shortest verse in the Bible. It's the verse that we always used to memorize when we were kids uh, because there are only two words, Matthew eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. And Jesus wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus because he had empathy for Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, as they wept at his tomb. Jesus was powerful enough to raise Lazarus from the dead, yet compassionate enough that he wept literally with his friends and shared in their suffering and loss. Jesus revealed what a Jesus-hearted father looks like. He's one who loves consistently and loves and cares even about hopeless causes. Think about that. Is there a hopeless cause in your life? Is there a person that you've kind of given up hope on? I want you to know Jesus hasn't given up. The heart of Jesus is to always believe, to always trust, to always welcome, to always bring in closer those that are far away. Years ago, I was young. Now I'm old. I can say that like David said. And I was pastoring on the Oregon coast. I was still in my 20s, maybe early 30s when this took place. But I had a, a, a small Bible that uh, uh, leather bound, 
And I bought it when I was in the high when I was in high school, probably in 1972 or 71, maybe back. You know, that was an eternity ago, right? And uh, so I bought this Bible, and it's leather bound. And uh, I'd read through that Bible in high school, and I carried it with me every day to school and used it in witnessing. So uh, by that time, you know, I'm 20. Uh, eight, 29, maybe 30 years old. So I lived half my life with this little Bible. And when I started to pastor, uh, when I didn't want to carry a, a big Bible around, I'd carry my little Bible because I could keep it in my pocket. And uh, I lost that leather-bound Bible. And it, it really disturbed me that I'd lost it because it was precious to me. I was a pastor, and I used that. And, and uh, I, I had written in it, and I just thought, how could I have been so foolish and careless to misplace that? But one thing is certain, when we lose something valuable to us, something that uh, we care a lot about, our emotions rise. And uh, we're prone to shame and blame. I even accused our little kids uh, in, in our household, uh, did you take dad's Bible to Sunday school? Because they got like candy or something when they brought a Bible to Sunday school in those days. And uh, shame on me for trying to blame my children for my lost Bible. But, you know, so how do you feel when you lose something dear to you? Can you name the emotions? Because Jesus cares about every one of those. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's angst, maybe it's regret, maybe it's sorrow, maybe it's shame or blame. How do you feel when you are lost or you've lost something you treasure? And maybe some of you here this morning feel this sense of loss. Maybe you're grieving about something in your life. Maybe you still haven't gotten over the things that were going on during the pandemic. And, and maybe you lost someone in the pandemic. I lost two of my best friends. Uh, almost my own age, uh, one of pa well, they were both pastors, and uh, it impacted me in a tremendous way, just the sense of their loss. Sometimes I think about calling my friend Gary, and uh, yeah, he's in heaven now, or calling my friend Jeff, who uh, was my own age. We graduated the same time and in high school and, and kind of grew up as adults together and following Jesus. But when we lose something, loss and grief encounter us on our journey of life. They create shadows and darkness. And that darkness may cloud our vision of God who has promised to comfort us even in the valley of the shadow of death. Jesus came to show us that in the shadows resides a father with a heart filled not only with the law, and justice, but also a heart overflowing with grace and mercy and truth. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, don't think that I came to destroy the law or prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come to judge us. Jesus came to justify us. Think about that. He came to justify us with his own righteousness as a substitute for our sinful behaviors. Now, I want to give you something because our Heavenly Father is gracious and generous and a giver. I love photography and I love Snoqualmie Falls because I live just a mile away from Snoqualmie Falls. So this is, anybody know what this is? It's a picture of Snoqualmie Falls at sunset. And uh, on the back, you could figure out that this is a postcard. Now, those of you that are not as old as I am probably have no idea what a postcard is. But a postcard is the way we used to communicate before we got text messages and email and social media and all that kind of stuff. If you went someplace like Snoqualmie Falls, you'd buy a postcard like this. And you'd write on the back, you'd write, hey, I'm at Snoqualmie Falls, wish you were here. 
And, and then we'd put their address on it, the address, name and address of our friend. Then you had to put a stamp on it. See, the government wanted something out of this, too. And, uh, and then you'd put it in a mailbox, and like a month later, they'd get it. And you're already home, but that's okay. They say, well, I guess, I guess Don was at, what is Snoqualmie Falls? Yeah, well. Wish you were there, wish I was too. Wish, why didn't you bring me along? I don't know. Because, so I've got one of these postcards for every one of you that wants one back on the book table. And by the way, the books that we have back there, if you can't afford them, you can take them for whatever you can afford to give or take them for free. That's okay, because we want to be generous like our Heavenly Father is generous. So Jesus told stories everywhere he went. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus told three stories. Now think about that. And I love uh, Luke chapter 15 because uh, in this, Jesus told these three stories that uh, show us uh, about God's love for the lost how much he loves the lost. That's the point of all three of the stories in Luke chapter 15. Uh, Jesus told about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Each one of those stories shows God's love for the lost. They're an expression, really, of John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So you think about that, that probably the most profound verse in all of the Bible. And in that verse, he's showing us the Jesus heart of the Father. God loved the world so much that he gave. And, uh, and then I love the next verse, verse 17, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. That's what's in the heart of our Father God. It's to give, it's to love, it's to produce mercy and grace and kindness. It's to lean in and it's to welcome back the, the ones that are lost. So in, in Luke chapter 15, it says in verse 1, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, but uh, it says, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Listen, that's a profound statement because what it says is people that were far from God, who felt hopeless, who felt like they didn't have a chance, who felt like God didn't love them, didn't care about them, wouldn't be interested in them, they listened to Jesus and heard him. You know, it's a different thing from us hearing something and us really listening to it and us really leaning into it. And, and it says that they, the tax collectors and the sinners, the people that others judged as being far from God, they loved Jesus and they drew near to him to hear him. But it says in the next verse, the scribes and the Pharisees complained. See, they were the professors. They were the teachers of the law. They're the ones like me that taught in the seminaries or Bible schools of the day. But they just didn't get it because what they got is look, they got, we are here to judge. And here, we're here to catch any violation of the law. We're not here like the welcome person at Walmart. We're here like the TSA agent at the airport we just suspect that you're doing so you're up to something or you wouldn't be here no actually most of the people are here because they want to get on one of those airplanes sooner if possible than later and uh so god's not like a tsa agent he's like a greeter he, he he wants us to come and so jesus spoke this parable to them so there's a crowd of people here but especially the scribes and pharisees the teachers of the law and Jesus starts telling these stories, and that's one reason that the common people, the lawyers, the tax, collect the tax collectors, the sinners, they love Jesus because he told stories. And the first story is about a lost sheep, and in the story of the lost sheep, a man owns 100 sheep, and one of them disappears. 
Sheep are prone to wander off. The Bible tells us that we all, like sheep, have lost our way, gone astray. But the Lord laid on Jesus, the Lamb of God, the iniquity, the sins of us all so that we could be saved. Listen, sheep are dumb. I grew up on a farm in Oregon. I write about that experience in growing up on a farm in my book about growing disciples. And uh, Bud Fisher, our neighbor uh, in the next farm over, he liked to raise sheep. And uh, he really liked to raise horses, but he had, he had a few sheep. He was kind of a hobby farmer. He was actually the barber in town and didn't take very good care of his sheep. But one spring, about the time of uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, we looked out in the, across the field at Bud's sheep, and they had turned green. And we thought... Well, Bud wasn't a Catholic. He was a Presbyterian, so we were kind of scratching our heads like he probably, did, you know, he wouldn't paint his sheep green for St. Patrick's Day, would he? Some people might do that. I don't know. So we, we decided to go, you know, walk to the edge of our field to the fence and look at Bud's sheep. And when we got close enough, we realized that what had happened was there in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, it rains a lot in the spring and St. Patrick's Day, and, and uh, Bud had not sheared his sheep for a long time. And in the, the following summer or fall, I think they probably rolled around in the grass a little bit and got a bunch of hayseed stuck in their wool. And just natural thing, they germinated and they started growing. Now, that you might think that's a real smart thing for sheep to do, but I don't think they did that intentionally, grow their own pasture so that it was portable. But uh, it just showed us that sheep are dumb. They really are dumb, okay? You have to trust me on that. But in this story, we see that the odds are just one out of a hundred. One out of a hundred. Even if there's only one out of a hundred, the, the shepherd went after that sheep. And it says that he left the 99 safe ones in the wilderness while he went out. And when he found the lost sheep, he carries it back tenderly. And not only that, but he rejoices by telling his neighbors about it. The lost sheep was found and they had a celebration. Next thing Jesus tells a story about is a, a woman who had 10 silver coins and she lost one of them. Now here the odds are getting greater because it's one out of 10. In the story of the lost sheep, it's one out of 100. Now it's one out of 10. And this woman, that was a significant part of her uh, you know, ability to sustain herself those 10 silver coins, and to lose one of them, the Bible said, Jesus says in the story, that she turned on every light, that meant she, meant she lit the lamps or candles, whatever she needed, and swept the house out, probably had a dirt floor, and, and, and kept looking, never gave up, and she found it. And she was so happy that she went and told all of her neighbors, and they also had a party. They rejoiced together with her because now she wouldn't be as impoverished as she already was, but because she still had all 10 of her coins. Now, then Jesus told the most important story, a story about a father and a lost son. Now, this time, the odds are one out of two because the father had two sons. And I'm going to read just read this story to you. In verse 11, it says, certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Notice that this son didn't ask the father. He demanded of the father. He said, give me, give me. He didn't say, Hey, Dad, you know, I haven't always been the best son, but, you know, I was thinking if you could give me some money, I'd like to go invest it, you know, or start a business of my own or something like that. But this son was rude. This son was a prodigal. 
This son wasted everything that his father had given him, and it was, would have been the equivalent in those days to a father saying to, uh, to a son, t- saying to his father, I just assume you were dead because when you are dead, I'm going to get whatever inheritance I've got coming to me. So I, 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 I know you're not dead yet, but I'd still like to get what I've got coming to me. Well, what he had coming to him was probably a knuckle sandwich. But anyway, that wasn't what the father did. Listen to this. It says, not many days after the father gave him what he asked for, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. He became a hog feeder. That's what this young man did. And uh, it says he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose and came to his father. Now listen, here's the rest of the story. Here's what you probably have never thought of before or maybe never heard of, because I've never heard a sermon like this in my life, and I was raised in the church, and I preached on the prodigal son so many times. And I know what it's like to take care of pigs, because I raised pigs when I was in high school, when Jody and I were dating. I would be out in the barn on Saturday night or maybe on Friday afternoon. I'd be cleaning out the pig stalls, and I'd be working with the pigs, doing various operations with them, which were very much hands-on. And let me just tell you, there you get a smell on your hands and your body that you can't just wash off. I called it essence of swine. And I would go in the house, and I would take a shower, and I would wash my hair, and I would scrub my hands, and then I'd put aftershave, you know, like in those days, we had high karate. It was supposed to make you really cool. And uh, aftershave, and I put that on. And even after all of that, all of those ablutions, I still, if I smelled close enough, essence of swine was still a little bit of it there. So here's this young Jewish boy that has been out feeding the pigs. Now, here's what the scribes and Pharisees were thinking. Because the first two stories were feel-good stories. They were feel-good stories. The the shepherd lost his one out out of 100 sheep, and he got it back. It was a celebration story. The second story about the woman that lost one out of 10. It was a celebration story when she... When she found her lost coin, everybody's happy about it. They all get that. That's all in alignment with the law and the Old Testament and nothing, nothing there that is particularly theological. But all three stories together were meant to show the Father's love. Here's what the scribes and Pharisees were thinking as Jesus starts telling this story. They're thinking to themselves, well, this story isn't going to have a happy ending. This story is going to end differently. This story isn't going to end with a party. That kid, yeah, he's going to get what he's got coming to him. He disrespected his father. He sinned against his father. He sinned against his whole family, and he's, got, he's going to get what he's got coming to him. And that's what they're all expecting Jesus to hear. In fact, You can read it in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. And I never really put these two stories together until a couple of years ago. I've read through the Bible every year for 40 years. And it wasn't until a year or two ago that I was reading Deuteronomy 21, and I read this. 
If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he was. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now imagine you're hearing the story of the prodigal son for the first time. And imagine that you didn't know anything about the New Testament. If you'd been in Jesus' audience that day as he told those three stories, when he got to the one about the prodigal son, his audience would have been waiting to hear how the prodigal was stoned to death according to the Old Testament law when he came home to his father. However, the story clearly shows how Jesus came not to destroy the law, nor did he come to enforce the law. He came to fulfill the law. Only Jesus could have told this story because it was a prophecy of all of us, all of God's lost children. And hey, it started with his first two children, Adam and Eve, that were prodigals and disobeyed God. Now we're all sinners. We all need to return to the Father's house. We all need to say, hey, I've sinned in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son or your daughter, but you gave Jesus so that we can be found. So here's my takeaways from these, this particular story. First is that our Jesus-hearted Heavenly Father is outrageously generous. The Father was waiting. He gives this kid not what he was expecting to be just called a servant again, but he gives him a ring and a robe and new shoes to wear, cleans him up inside and out. Secondly, it shows that our Heavenly Father is always hopeful and never gives up on his children. That son was coming home, and the father didn't know when, but he was waiting and watching for that son to return. It also shows us that our Jesus-hearted Heavenly Father loves unconditionally. He threw his arms upon his son, replaced his rags with a royal robe, gave him back a ring, restored his dignity, Rejoice that the lost had been found. Finally, our Jesus-hearted Heavenly Father celebrates when lost children are found. Rather than calling the elders of the land or the community to come and serve as a judge and a jury and executioners, he called for the neighbors to celebrate with a party. Now the scribes and Pharisees really had something to talk about. No wonder they wanted to get rid of Jesus because Jesus literally was fulfilling the law in a way that no one else could have expected. When the lost is found, there is a good reason to celebrate. And this must have been an amazing concept. And think of what good news that was to those scribes and Pharisees if only they'd accepted it at face value. That's why the sinners that were there, the tax collectors like Matthew, Levi, that were there, they rejoiced in this message because it gave them hope. So what about my lost Bible? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I was spending about six weeks looking, searching for that lost Bible and worrying about it regretting, blaming, all of that stuff. One day I'm in my office praying. I'm a pastor, okay? And I'm praying and I find myself thinking, well, what, I wonder what I did with that Bible. I was obsessed by this lost Bible. And uh, it was like the Lord spoke to me and said, hey, Bozo, have you even prayed about it? Well, that was a novel idea for a pastor. And I said, I was convicted. And I said, Lord, no, I've been looking on my own. I've been blaming and I've been, you know, searching. And I said, Lord, you know where that Bible is. Help me find it. And so one day, 
a few days later, I got a thought, and I found the Bible. And uh, here's the deal. I remembered that the last time I'd used that Bible was in a minister's meeting there on the Oregon coast in Lincoln City. How many of you ever been to Lincoln City? We were at a restaurant right on the beach there in Lincoln City. And so I got on the phone. That's all that you had was a landline in those days. This is in the 1980s. And I called that restaurant, and I said, hey, I, I wonder if you have a lost and found department. They said, yes, we do. Hey, what have you lost? And I said, well, I hope you found my lost Bible. I said, have you found a Bible? And the person said, let me check. I think so. And uh, it was a guy that answered the phone. And a couple of minutes later, a lady came to the phone. And uh, she said, yes, we, we found your Bible. We have your Bible. And I said, that's wonderful. I said, would it be OK if I come tomorrow, I think, or the next day? And, and uh, I said, can I come and pick it up? And uh, she said, I suppose that would be OK. And there's something about the way that she responded to me that kind of gave me pause. And, and I asked her, would, would there be a problem with that? And she said, no, not really. Uh, she said, but I, I've been reading it. And I said, really, you've been reading my Bible? She said, yeah, I have. So I prayed about that. And uh, I was on my way to pick up my Bible that I had lost and was so precious to me and still is to this day. And uh, I'd stopped at a Christian bookstore. They had those things in those days. And I bought her a, a Bible. I bought her a Bible. I thought if she's reading the Bible, she needs a Bible. So I got there and uh, found the lady and found my Bible and discovered that her name was Marcy. And that Marcy was actually the owner of this restaurant that faced Pacific Ocean. And her husband was an attorney in town. And I had a conversation with Marcy, and, and I asked her, I said, uh, tell me, what, what caused you to pick up my Bible and start reading it? She said, well, you know, I've got a brother that's a Jesus freak, and he's always telling me that I should be reading the Bible. So one day when I found that Bible, after I knew there was a bunch of preachers, pastors that were meeting there, and uh, she said, it's one of you left your Bible behind. And I'd never written my name and address in it for some stupid reason. But anyway, uh, she said, uh, I just started reading it. And I started to share with Marcy. First of all, I said, you know, as you were reading my Bible, did you read John 3.16 where uh, Jesus tells us that God the Father loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. She said, yeah. I, I said, do you believe that? She said, yes, I, I believe that. I said, Marcy, did, did you read anything in the book of Romans? And I took her over to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 where it says that uh, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23, which says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I said, but you know, the good news is Romans 5.8, where it says God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I said over in Romans chapter 10 and, and verse 13, it tells us that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord, that's verse 13, will be saved. And she said, yeah, I believe, I believe all of that. And as we're talking and having this conversation, there are tears that are running down her cheek. I can remember it just like it was yesterday. And I said, Marcy, you know, in, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I said, Marcy, wouldn't you like to place your trust and faith in Jesus today? She said, I sure would. And 
It was my privilege to pray with Marcy and lead her to Jesus. And you know, this lost Bible changed not only Marcy's life, but it changed my life as a pastor, as a person. Because one day, a whole group of pastors were sitting in that restaurant, and Marcy was serving us. And not a one of us had the inclination to tell her about Jesus. Not a one of us had the inclination to think then realize that she had a brother that was praying for her. That if we had given her a Bible, she would have read it. She was that much of a seeker, no outward sign. But that's what was going on in the heart. And if only we understood, and maybe some of you are watching today and online and, and uh, you're like Marcy, you want Jesus to come into your heart. And maybe you're here this morning, and I'd ask you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And God's been speaking to your heart, and you've begun to realize how much our Heavenly Father loves us and cares about us and is concerned about us and welcomes us when we come and return to the Father's house. So I wonder if there's one of you today that would say, you know, I, I want to receive Jesus just like Marcy did. Maybe you're one that has wandered off a bit and you've come back and you're here today or you're watching this online and you're, you're, you know that you need Jesus in your heart. I'd just like you to raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you today. Wherever you are, up in the balcony, I see that hand. Others that would just raise a hand and say, that's me today. I need Jesus today. I, I just want to return to the Father. Maybe you've just kind of wandered off. Maybe you're here today because somebody invited you. Maybe you've, for the first time today, are hearing this story. Yeah, I see that hand. I see those hands today. I encourage you to just pray with me. You can pray out loud or pray in your heart. But this prayer is the prayer that Marcy prayed. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that you love me. Thank you for sending Jesus to save me from my sins. Lord, I know I've sinned against you and done wrong. And I'm sorry, Lord. I repent of my sins. I want to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for giving me a home in heaven and eternal life. I love you, Jesus. And I encourage you to just talk to Jesus like you would talk to a friend. He loves you. He cares about you. He's got a great purpose and plan for your life. Amen.